Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. I can't see all of your faces anymore, but I know there are a lot of familiar ones out there, and it's great to be here tonight for standing room only. Carl Fritsch, thank you for coming. I'm Alexandra Cunningham Cameron, and I'm a curator of contemporary design and Hint Secretarial Scholar here at Cooper Hewitt. Um, and we're so pleased that you're here tonight to celebrate the second annual NYC Jewelry Week, um, uh, annual, uh, with our program, Carl Fritsch, Jewelry on the Edge. So Cooper Hewitt is proud to be the official museum sponsor of NYC Jewelry Week. It's the first and only local week dedicated to promoting and celebrating the world of jewelry design through innovative, education-focused programming, like what we have for you tonight. Um, we're thrilled to welcome, thrilled to welcome, uh, Wellington, New Zealand-based artist, Carl Fritsch, and renowned gallerist and owner of Salon 94, Jeannie Greenberg Broaton. Carl will first give a presentation on his work for about 20 minutes, and then following this, I'll moderate a talk with Jeannie and Carl. Um, we certainly have a lot of ground to cover, but we want to make sure to leave some time at the end for some of your questions. Um, so just before I get started, I'd like to formally introduce our guests this evening. Carl Fritsch began his education at the Goldsmith School in Forsheim and studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich. He has taught in art schools across the world, exhibited internationally, and his work has been acquired for public collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Steidlich Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the National Gallery Victoria Museum, New Zealand, Te Papa Tongawara. Um, he's running a practice that's focused on the ring, as most of you all know. Uh, Fritsch explores taste, aesthetics, and desire as he manipulates perceived ideas of preciousness and convention. The highly covetable rings have seen him win numerous awards and become a cult figure in contemporary jewelry. He also works collaboratively with a range of artists, including artist Francis Upprichard and furniture designer Martino Gamper. In 2006, Carl received the highly prestigious international Francoise van den Bosch Award. Uh, Jeannie Greenberg Rowiton is a gallerist, art advisor, and curator, a fierce activist. She's committed to feminist and progressive politics, in keeping with her belief in art's power to bring about social change. Greenberg Rowiton founded her first gallery space in 2002 later adding venues on the Bowery in 2007 and 2010. Salon 94 is a unique project space in her home on 94th Street that explores the notion of traditional white box gallery. Many of you have probably seen Carl's show up that opened last night. Um, <clears throat> next year, she will consolidate her galleries to the former National Academy of Design on 3 East 89th Street, just a couple of blocks away. She has championed artists such as Huma Baba, Judy Chicago, Katie Grannon, David Hammonds, Lyle Ashton Harris, Mar Marilyn Minter, Lori Simmons, and Betty Woodman, among many others. Carl Fritsch's rings have been featured in her program since 2007. Greenberg Rowiton is radical in breaking hierarchies be between design and high art. In 2017, she founded Salon 94 Design to represent Max Lamb, Philippe Malouin, uh, who was a 2018 Wallpaper Designer of the Year, and Gaetano Pesce. Greenberg Rowton sits on the boards of White Columns and Performa. She's a member of the ADAA board and has served on the Freeze Art Fair Committee. So without further ado, I would love for you all to give a warm welcome to Carl Fritsch. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I've got 20 minutes. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts. I'm going to run you through my ring life. Um, here we go. OK, that's, that's where i grown up. This is a place called Sonthofen. It's in the Allgäu Alps on the border to Austria. There's lots of rain there. The clouds get stuck in the mountains. Long winters, I grew up on skis. 
There's this beautiful Algoi brown fee there, because there's lots of grass. And when I was bored at school, I started uh, scratching with a screwdriver those little figures. They, they're like an inch tall, and I had a screwdriver and some kind of soapstone. And that was uh, what actually got me interested after 13 years finishing high school to do something with my hands. And um, the idea was the tradition in that area was uh, wood carving. You know, those, those uh, Jesus some crosses, that kind of style. But uh, maybe luckily I missed the deadline being uh, 17, 18. And uh, when my mother went to a watchmaker, she met a woman there and she said, oh, her son is studying um, watchmaking at a jewelry and watchmaking school in Pforzheim. So she met that woman and uh, they, she told her son, he said, that watchmaker in jewelry school. And uh, she suggested that to me. I thought, yeah, well, I, I'll try. So I went there to this uh, Goldschmiede Schule in Pforzheim. You get a three-year apprenticeship there. And it was uh, actually love on the first side. I got in right away and I loved everything about it. The tools, the, you know, you, you, you were, we were busy like for, for one month, you do only file bits of, um, of brass. Very boring. Interesting enough, those pieces, this is kind of how you learn jewelry. You, and those pieces, they, I think that they are, they're a special genre of jewelry. They are designed and made to be, only to be measured. <laughs> you know, you make them and then the teacher goes and measures if you did it exactly the right size as the drawing. So that's uh, how it all started. Then at that school you learn a wide, a wide range of techniques, like this is all stone setting, you know, digging up those metal surfaces, properly setting those stones in, and, you know, extensively learning this. After two years at that school, you have a very good background in techniques. And then to finish off this apprenticeship, um, you had to go finish it off in a company. And I, I went uh, to a small silver jewelry producing company in Pforzheim. Um, the interesting bit was that being learning that jewelry in co co uh, commercial, conventional jewelry is just like produced like any mass <coughs> produced object, like a card. You know, the jewelers sit there, one gets like a bag and he only cuts off the sprue, the next one just sands it, the next one polishes it. And uh, so I went through all these uh, stages of production and also through the model making department. Which, which is, you know, where the designs are made. But designing there meant the boss comes like once a month, puts a magazine in front of you and says, oh, make something like this just a little bit smaller. <laughs> so anyway, there were some things I, I made there, but this, I knew this is not how I want to make jewelry. So, um, you know, relating back to the cow you see in the first image, this is a little cow utter on a pin. <laughs> So that was after this apprenticeship, I went back to my hometown and I just started doing things I felt like doing. So this, this utter is like a little container, you can open it up. And I was just making things I saw around me, like this little strawberry, it's like an inch tall, and it's not any strawberry, it's one strawberry from the garden. It's, I just exactly copied that strawberry. It's the, uh, identical to the real one almost. Uh, same thing, it opens up and you can put something in it. And I was just chasing away those um, fruits and vegetables. And, you know, wh where do I go with that? And um, I heard about the um, jewelry uh, class at the Academy of Fine Art in Munich. They had a, a jewelry and hollowware department. So I went there with my sheets of vegetables and showed it to the professor. Hermann Junger was a press professor there. For the jewelers, you will know, he's a very important figure, figure for just the contemporary jewelry world. His work mostly uh, comes from draw, inter interpreting drawings in a very free uh, way and just keeping, keeping it all alive in metal then. So Hermann looked at it and said, mm, mm, yeah, mm, okay. I mean, I, I think it was just strange enough for him. Um, to get me in. 
then there wasn't, I was in that academy and, you know, being a mountain boy and, you know, then there's all about art and what's jewelry, what's art, what's contemporary jewelry, what's the problem, uh, a lot of confusion, you know, thinking about things and, uh, you know, cow theories. You could visit all classes there, it's very open, you study there for a minimum of five years, so you're really given time to find your language. So uh, it, it didn't took, take long to get me in trouble. I made um, uh, these works so almost a year in, and I called them Verschandler, which is like Disgusta. <laughs> there was lots of beautiful gold work done, and I, in the sense of, you know, jewelry is a um, um, medium to attract attention. I thought, you know, something ugly might actually work better to attract attention than something beautiful, and uh, yeah, it, it took me quite a while to make something like this. But you know, we, we, it, got, it got into a quite heated discussion, and Herman didn't like, he probably didn't more like the attitude ab about it than the actual piece. But anyway, I, I thought I, I need to take a break, I need to see other places, I need to uh, see the world, and I came to New York and 30 <coughs> years ago for the first time. I was lucky I found a jeweler, Mario um, Salvucci. He unfortunately died not too long ago. Um, and yeah, this was the view for where I was living uh, between B and C on 8th Street. It was quite, uh, yeah, uh, some friends, when I said, come over, they said, oh no, I don't want to be killed. <laughs> and look where I'm now. <laughs> but, um, you know, walking around, immediately I got to understand, you know, Popa, where, where it came from, you know, this refrigeration business on Bowery. I'm not sure if it's still there. But I had my go at like a pop art jewelry, like a highway on a chopstick on a potato <laughs> sandwich brooch. They're like as big as a hand or a potato on a chopstick on a gun sandwich brooch. <laughs> So they painted metal. Back home, in, this is the Eremitage in Bayreuth, the King's Castle. And uh, I, I just the use of um, stones, colored stones, the whole building covered with stones. A mosaic in the Milano train station, you know, out of little stones. I especially like the spiky hair on the guy's leg. Or oh, this is a 12th century Venetian necklace. These little buildings are all put together out of tiny little micro mosaics. So I had my go at stones again. You know, learning properly stone setting, then it, it was kind of that mosaic style gave me, you know, the idea, oh, I could just, you know, cover surfaces. So I, I found like those um, crystals, polished little crystals and created pieces. <laughs> You know, some first rings like that, or I, it allowed me those colored stones and uh, repousse allowed me to go quite decorative. This is probably the most decorative ones I did. But there's like, you know, emeralds on top of this uh, bulb and uh, you know, a mix of agates and uh, carnelian, carnelian. And then I thought very clever, oh, just, uh, you know, give the people a... Uh, a permanent marker and they can design it themselves. I'm not sure if this wasn't too successful. <laughs> but then reducing those shapes, and as this is still academy time, this is the first uh, pieces I used uh, casting again, you know, a technique I learned in industry to just multiply things. So this is, in this time, just used as one of a kind and leaving the, you know, like air bubbles or leaving things from casting on and not trying to refinish it. And a very key moment, moment in yeah, my whole making is that ring. Because to cast the, like the ring before, I, I, the best way, the cheapest way to get metal was going to the pawn shop and buy um, old jewelry. So that's what I usually did, and then melt it down, and in just you know one um, 
uh, moment, uh, having just the, this work in front of me, I, I started fixing them. So, you know, when the pawnbroker took the stone up because he, that has resale value, he, you know, I filled the, the gap again with a, a gold filling or, you know, rings like this. It's been classic conventional jewelry, but it, it's been uh, rejected. Somebody needed the money or whatever, sold it away, and um, it allowed me to have my input, my manipulation on it. And I felt very comfortable with it because, you know, this is pieces, that kind of jewelry I learned making in poor time. This is the jewelry I grew up with, my aunties, my, my mother would wear. And I could just now, gave me a way to turn them into something completely different or, you know, fixing the ring shank, giving them a whole new character. Like the ring offered its new design itself, you know, I just had to help the ring to become a new one. And it almost felt like a jewelry psychiatrist, you know, <laughs> having those rejects from, you know, they've been rejects and I, give, I bring them into this jewelry life on a very different um, level again. I've always been interested in the processes that are involved in the making, you know, this also cast uh, 14 karat gold cast on the 18 karat gold and just what gold does through the casting process, it, it, it gets oxidized, it's all brown and I just, I like the look, it's, it's the real thing, you know, it's, gold does that itself, it's not I'm adding this to it. it, that's how it looks like and I just like showing that as well and when you wear it, it polishes itself, so the metal quality will, you know, show its, sh uh, show itself. Always, uh, you know, art thing, and there's always wondering where this kind of comes from, and then it's actually not too long ago in my auntie's garden, I realized, you know, I saw this rail that they built, so, you know, my aunties, they just, they want to have a rail for their chairs, they just find what they have and just, you know, stick it together, that's it, it's, uh, it's um, immediate, it looks like, because that's what they wanted, and uh, it's just, I, I, I think, you know, seeing this, then um, making the jewelry, it's, um, you, you, it took me a long time to realize, you know, that actually those, how much those things that I've seen growing up influenced me. <laughs> This very happy <coughs> woman is a, a car registration officer in uh, South Australia in Perth. I was very happy to take, have a photo taken. I just came to me that, you know, you go around on the other side of the world, this was still living in Germany, but conventional jewelry just looks the same wherever you go, it's quite shocking. It's actually quite interesting. There is a, a great vi um, video or interview with a Japanese architect up here, Hiroshi Sambuichi, who, who he says that in architecture as well, that you know how um, modern architecture all over the world kind of starts looking the same and it's not adapting to actually local weather and uh, conditions. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. You know, same thing, um, that's how conventional jewelry look, looks like and keeps looking like, but, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's just had more goes at that um, things. You know, these are brooches like my aunties would wear and I, I, I found broken ones and just replaced some balls, uh, cast some gold where the pearls are missing. It's kind of fixing, repairing them. These are not, you know, they, they've been fashion brass cheap things, but I, they, they meant something <laughs> to uh, people. I was even making cufflinks and tie pins back then. A brooch, um, that was one thing at the academy with Herman, studying with Herman Jünger you almost had to gain a brooch license. Like you, when people were making a brooch, you, you had to look and 
Only if he said, you know, that's good enough, you were allowed to put a pin in the bag. And, <laughs> and the pin had to be, you know, really, you've got to find out the right solution. So these brooches were designed. Um, I got the pin first, and kind of the pin <laughs> designed what's coming out in the brooch. Double loop. Uh, yeah, just what I, the, what the pin bags, these are just conventional hobby shop pin bags, what they offered me. Um, one of the first pieces casting just stones, rubies in, into place. You know, industry does cast stones into place as well. This is not something new. It's just they do it a bit more properly than me. I like the moment of uh, things getting out of control. So, you know, when those classic rings uh, just develop their own life or from the process, what's sticking out where the diamonds are set in is actually the sprue where this ring is cast. So um, just celebrating something that's actually just a technical piece. This is, yeah, uh, kind of the fridge pavé and my lazy pavé, which I think are very popular. Uh, it's um, stone setting is another thing. I learned stone setting, you know, intensely at school, and it's 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 hard. It's labor intense, and it took me a long time. It took me ten years to come back to it, free enough to use it in my own way. You know, how to apply it so that I that it, it's mine, it, it became my technique. Before it was something I learned, it's uh, by instruction, but this, I, uh, I owned it then. Uh, sorry, some slides are not that great, but this is, you know, a whole diamond uh, extra finger. <laughs> this is just, um, it's a piece about uh, oh, wasting time, it's, uh, Passing time, this uh, when my son Max was born, when he was a baby, he wasn't a good sleeper, so he liked to be carried around. And as soon as he sit down and don't move, he would start to cry. And so I took him to the workshop, and when uh, he was around my front, and I was, I could set, when I was setting stones, there was enough movement that he could go to sleep. <laughs> So I just had that sheet, I just filled that sheet of silver full of all little rubies, sapphires, emeralds uh, that I had, and so, you know, to keep him asleep. <laughs> Denise has another ring of that series. <laughs> I couldn't do that again. That's the little teddy bear toy from my aunties. Um, they just keep fixing, the dog's pulling it apart and they keep fixing it. But, you know, they wouldn't really like my rings, but, you know, they're doing the same thing. <laughs> In, I think it was 97, I was invited as a jeweler, uh, artist in residence, kind of to Erfurt, a town in the former east, sitting in the valley. And, um, and I, I, I had to come up with a project, and I... I said, well, I'm, I wasn't quite sure what I'm doing, so I said, okay, I'm going to look for gold, metaphorical, but actually in the local natural history museum, there was a book about, about gold prospecting in the medieval times, and there were maps in the books, and I tried to find those places in the maps again, and got myself some equipment and started um, <laughs> digging there and washing for you know hours and days and weeks. And... Um, this is an example of a um, piece of a trophy that one of the emperors of that area had made of his own gold, but it took, I think, 50 workers a year to find enough gold. So even back then, there wasn't, there wasn't that much gold. But that's the piece of gold I found. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I, was, I was as happy, I was incredible, because... I, it's a real great experience for every jeweler go out and go gold prospecting because it, it makes you aware how special that material actually is because it pop if you if there's gold there you <laughs> you'll see very conceptual piece the pin is out of white gold and you know white gold is the most refined from <coughs> furthest uh, away from nature possible from gold, but you know, the, the pin is much more valued. 
as material value than my little gold nugget, but my little gold nugget is everything to me. <laughs> Just, you know, jewelry, uh, another <laughs> use of a safety pin. How, you know, can a safety pin can be a piece of jewelry? What happens, yeah. it, what the context does to a piece of jewelry, how a, a piece of jewelry become a whole symbol for a whole culture? Jewelry is an applied art, you know, it's when the person and the jewelry come together. It's amazing. Um, yeah, this is just not celebrating as much craftsmanship and, uh, you know, as the pieces before. That's like my version. I, of the gold, you know, must have had enough being shaped over centuries. So it's just like 300 gram of fine gold running down. Alexis Chist. One of my first solo shows is, um, I was not, uh, 96 or something. I just put all my rings in one showcase, like it's the cutout, like almost like of a piece of meadow. That's uh, my first um, museum exhi exhibition. I thought, wow, wow, now, you know, I've made it. This is the new museum in Nuremberg, you know, as a jeweler to make it into the holy halls. And then this was the opening. That's all the people that were there. <laughs> and and I, I know all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> here we go. That's, an, that's another yeah, museum show of when I, that Francois van den Bosch uh, prize in um, the State of the Museum in van den Bosch. There were, uh, there were a few more people. Uh, but always, it comes down to the individuals you reach, you meet, you make contact. This guy, Andy Lim, he's a book publisher. He, I published those books uh, with him, and he got a real fan he, he didn't know this jewelry exists. He got a real fan of it and published a huge uh, compendium. Some of you might in here probably involved and seen it. And this is the book printer. You know, he got a ring for his partner. And Mitsu is a bow maker because Andy Lim collects uh, violin bows. So, and you meet those specialists, and those specialists they could actually totally connect to this world. Uh, and and that's been always amazing to. Yeah, get people, new people involved. Yeah, this is some of the, some of the, the mad book Andy publishes. This is a book of 4,000 drawings of an artist friend of ours. And then, you know, he asked me to make a handle that is totally not usable. <laughs> but, you know, this is still, I was still after my studies making stuff, I mean, 20, Five years ago, you know, without friends like my friend Muk, who was an architect who had a you know stable job, who, when uh, uh, money was needed, he would buy something. Or or Lore, a good friend who's really one person who's just not shy in wearing something extra again and just having you know enjoying this. So those been really beautiful, important people. Once I sent some stones to get holes cut through, and um, because I, I, I needed the stones with the holes, and the stone cutter sent me back all the, the cores that he drilled out. I didn't expect them. So actually, all the, all the precious stones sticking out have been the leftovers, but actually, that was the most exciting <laughs> bit of, um, of the whole project. You've seen those, those piles of stones, letting the stone just build an own shape and you know not using stones just as a decoration point on a piece of jewelry i get pushed for 5 minutes i race through i'll flick quickly it's like one carat of diamonds stuck on a wedding ring um those rings um this is interesting a uh, um diamond um company hilton from South Africa, he saw those rings and he wanted to design a new contemporary line with um, diamonds. And he, you know, he's producing Tiffany diamonds. I was like, yeah, sure, you know, things are 
never could put my hand on before. And we designed a group of work that was presented in Comme des Garçons stores in Tokyo, I think also in New York. That was, you know, I, I love solitaire rings. That was um, one, <laughs> one of those solitaire rings. You know, this is the same thing, a diamond ring. I, I like coming back to those classics in, in jewelry, you know. Everybody, if I say solitaire ring, you have a picture, but I like, I'd like to offer a new version today, a new, well, how can it look today? Another uh, part of my practice is now and then I do workshops, teach workshops, which is actually quite helpful because usually I'm in my studio just making stuff and I don't have ex to explain things to myself or talk to myself, so this is actually quite helpful sometimes that I you know, find words for what I actually do. This was, uh, yeah, when uh, Jeannie when, uh, entered with Francis, the rings entered your world. So this is a sculpture from Francis. Uh, you bridged a sloth, and that sloth is wearing my jewelry. And uh, it's very, <laughs> so it's, it's not that great. But this is how, yeah, our world's connected. And, and um, Jeannie, um, obviously, discovered those rings, and it's funny, the sloth has been, there's another sloth who went through, been sold and through another auction, and every time it comes up, it has less rings on. <laughs> <laughs> I like those collaborations with Francis U. Bridget. Uh, this is just, uh, that was that. That's a, a long time ago in my workshop, but it, it, it always looks uh, kind of similar. It's full of things. I never come to an empty workshop. There's lots of things just waiting to be made and to be finished and to be taken on. So I, once, I started this process a long time ago and it just keeps me, you know, I'll, I, it's, there's always something. Sometimes it's quick, like this, you know, it's spontaneous. I like working with wax. I sometimes can be quick and I know, oh, this is good. That's finished and ready to cast. Sometimes things sit there for years. Some, I have some waxes sitting 15, 20 years there and waiting to be a pace. Ruby rings. I'm going to see no more time sign coming up. <laughs> Oh, you know, sometimes, you know, ruby rings, some too simple one is quite, come back to um, most convincing. This is a kind of raw ruby, dancing ruby. Raw diamond. I'd like the same thing, raw diamond. You know, diamond, everybody knows diamond, but, you know, it, it's uh, the raw form is... Uh, if you see it, you, you, you'll get that it's a special thing. Solitaire rings, uh, you know, real solitaire. This is just a rock. This is, uh, yeah, quite conceptual. The most precious bit about, it's a diamond with holes. It wasn't easy to find somebody to put that hole in that diamond. <laughs> and it's not cheap either. So actually, you know, the most expensive bit is the bit that's missing. You can just take that for a wonder. <laughs> Solitaire ring. You know, how do you set a stone? So that's quite obvious. <laughs> and, you know, it's... You're, as a jeweler, it's nice. Sometimes I get images like that sent in an email. You know, you're not an undertaker or a dentist. You should just ha people are usually happy. That was uh, Daniel gave his partner that as an engagement ring after 20 years, and so you know, it's it's really nice. You, it's a nice relationships you you form. It's me. <laughs> Even the sheep are bejeweled in New Zealand, where I live since 10 years now. Oh, back to the cow. Mm -hmm. 
I still like, you know, this part of making jewelry as a jeweler. People come and everybody has like jewelry uh, inherited. Uh, and once a woman came to me, gave me all her old rings and said, oh, can you turn this into something, a new ring? And, you know, I just took it all out and piled it all <laughs> in there. Oh, this is from a ring from a series called Seven Deadly Sins. This was greed. And this was uh, Eitelkeit. I know it, it's funny. I, I used to, you know, for, for a long time, try, try to get rings into places, and then it's sometimes the rings take actually me to places. And sometimes you get, the, you know, they make up those funny invites. I just saw a weird invite. But this is actually one person uh, with, she, she owns all those rings. This is, you know, so nice. <laughs> 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 this is probably the heaviest ring I, I've made. It's like two kilo on my <laughs> finger. Yeah, diamond ring. I've had a go at some signet rings <laughs> lately. I hope you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, start, I made a series of rings abusing my colleagues. <coughs> this is Otto Stoff. He was my professor also. And oh, Rotman sucks. <laughs> at, an opening, <laughs> at an opening at his house. I could sell that three times. I couldn't. <laughs> it's just one presentation where, like, all uh, rings sitting on that eel skeleton. Ich weiß es nicht. That's I don't know in German. And that's my auntie, uh, Annie. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be on the stage with two people I admire so much. Um, and hearing you walk through. I meant to put the, 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 the next thing on. <laughs> the narrative of your life and work has been um, incredible. Uh, Sorry. I, I wanted to read a, a quote to you your own quote, I hope you don't mind, which was included in the retrospective at your gallery. The ring is desperate, desperate to find a finger, desperate to tell you, I love you, I'm beautiful, I'm rich, I'm cool, I hate you, I come from Ireland or Austria, I want more, I have enough, I'm married, I'm funny, I'm scary, stupid, important, I can't help you. I am. When and why did you start focusing on rings? Oh, um, a, a pretty long time ago, but it just naturally evolved. There was not, mm. I, I couldn't, pin, it wasn't a decision I made, uh, you know, now I make rings. It just evolved into that being my favorite medium and favorite uh, volume to work with and also just trying it on. I've been wearing them all, so mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, I like that fact. And uh, you can tell much better if a ring's good than if earrings are good, so. Mm. So uh, we always say that um, you, you make rings um, for the wearer. And in fact, uh, when we wear our jewelry, the only jewelry we can actually see is the rings on our fingers. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something very special that you, um, when you when you wear earrings, you wear them usually for the enjoyment of others. And it's a kind of gift to other people. And when you put on a necklace, it gives you a certain kind of carriage. Um, but a ring is, is this wonderful, intimate experience that you have uh, all, all the time. And uh, so that's, it's, it's kind of a gift. And in fact, most of the rings do come in Carl's size. 
So <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that some larger, larger they're rings. really big, and um, and we're really grateful that uh, that Carl also has collaborations with other jewelers, and we have a jeweler in New York who mm -hmm. comes and and fits them. <laughs> yeah, but the rings come in Carl's size in more than just a literal size, also because the rings are are telling your story, and they're yeah. they're in a way expressing. Um, your pleasure, your pain, fantasy, uh, and so they're also for you. Yeah, mm. sure, you don't want to know all of it. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I can pick some and, and can identify, but mm. they, uh, you know, I, I speak in rings. Mm. I, that's me, <laughs> what's on the table there. And, but I don't want, you don't have to know it's open. It's meant, you know, you can interpret it your way. I don't have to unload my, uh, you know, my life onto you. Uh, there was something that happened last night that was was pretty interesting. That tells two stories. One was your story. Um, a collector came in to choose a ring for his wife, who he had been in a um, very big fight with, and. Um, <laughs> He went down the line, and I said, oh, pick something beautiful for her. And instead, he chose the ring with all the screws. And um, <laughs> you know, it was, the, it was really the most violent ring there. And I said, you clearly don't want to make up with your wife. <laughs> and, um, and Carl looked at it and said, oh, I made that ring when I was building my studio. And you could feel all the work of your studio in that one ring, the frustration and, um, and all, all the tools that it takes and the time. And um, so off he went with, with that ring to make up with his wife. And um, so I, I love how the rings do tell these stories that we make them our own as well. Yeah. And, and you were also saying, Jeannie, that the ring transforms the wearer. Oh, absolutely! It, yeah. be, it, it you know it bewitches us mm -hmm. um, in a certain way, and and also each ring really does find their own person, and um, that's why I always really encourage people to pick them up and try them on and see what suits them, um, because different and and also what suits you changes through time as well. Yeah. I mean that. And, that's yeah. also I. I I like the term applied art. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I think that's what it is. It doesn't. It's not a minor thing. It's it's when the mm. thing is applied. It's actually its final destination, and that's when it proves how mm -hmm. good it is. And mm -hmm. and these are great moments when when they happen. And yeah. I, I think it, it's a very good prescription mm -hmm. of yeah I, what I do. Yeah. In fact, I you know on a personal level. One of the rings that you showed was that raw diamond ring, mm -hmm. which um, I actually asked you to make me a raw diamond ring because all of a sudden I started to look at my own wedding ring um, years later, and, and I was uncomfortable wearing it. Yeah. And I thought, why am I still wearing this with this you know emerald cut diamond? I you know it doesn't feel like me anymore. And the minute I put on the raw diamond to kind of counterbalance my other one, I, 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 it kind of became alive again. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, you know, that, that I was really grateful for. And so I still wear mm -hmm. now a different raw diamond from you um, every day, because that one's too big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> too <heavy. laughs> but that sense of connection with the wearer, I think, is, is quite important. You know, you are putting a very specific story in each unique ring. And when people are approaching your work, in a way they're reading what you're putting into it, but also, you know, in a way projecting their own desires and fantasies and interests and curiosity onto this, this particular mm -hmm. object. Um, but you are also very connected to your work. Uh, I have one of your rings, which is the KF. Carl's initials, and he did not know before a couple of days ago that I had this ring, and I've never seen such pleasure on someone's face to be reunited with his ring, which yeah, he never I, thought he was going to see again. I, I'd never think anybody would buy my initials <laughs> as a ring. Yeah, but it's a perfect example. But I had to make it, you know, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a thing. It's something I, I had to make. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and it's, I mean, it's great that, I mean, 
this almost felt unsellable for me, but <laughs> here we go. <laughs> it, it, it's so fitting that, yeah. uh, that a curator... I know, super fan, be, clearly. You know, clearly. But, but should be, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And that's, that's why, it, it, you know, the rings find the right finger yeah. and the right person. Yeah. So. And so many people also, you know, see what they want to see in the ring. In this one in particular, it's initials but it's an abstraction in most cases to people yeah. and they don't see your initials you know and the those hidden values are so integral to your work right because you're playing with ideas of beauty and of value and do you think that's a responsibility of a jeweler or of jewelry to critique society today i wouldn't make it a rule if you feel like it yes absolutely you should I think it's important, but I wouldn't, you know. It's also all right if jewelry is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason for that, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you try and make everything ugly as well. <laughs> so it's a, you know. It, it <laughs> no, and that's I changed. What makes you an artist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, sure. I've got a challenge. I mean, it is, I, as I say, I. I want to make it my, you know, what can I say? It, it, it's got to be my, my thing to mm -hmm. say. Uh, that's why you're looking, you're looking for this new space, or what can you say, or what do I have to add to, to everything that's out there? Well, in fact, when I look at the, the signature ring, I think, um, you know, Calder, for many years, that's mm -hmm. what he did. He made, he made you know, all of his friends' signatures. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you don't make rings for other people necessarily. You make them for yourself first. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do a lot for myself. <laughs> mm. You started to talk a little bit about um, your influences and where you source materials in unorthodox places. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about your process, how much is planned out, how much of it is intuitive, how much your local environment influences you. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I thought I did that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an open range. Mm. Oh, it, I, I, I'm, I work very intuitively, but uh, sometimes, you know, as my brain, I have ideas too, and mm -hmm. then I, I process ideas. But I think the most uh, honest, uh, truthful things are when, I, when the things are just in front of me and I start making. That's when things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, then thinking kicks in, and, uh, but that's where I'm most comfortable. Mm -hmm. And when stuff there are happens no in front of me, yeah. but it can go anywhere, you mm -hmm. know, but this is, uh, mm -hmm. I need that, that's what I, I mm -hmm. need, I, mm -hmm. I'm, um, sometimes I go to the workshop with an idea, but it's, yeah, that's all right, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the, the comfortable areas is just me and the work in front of me, and uh, we go from there, and wherever it takes me. So, so we've collaborated on many shows together <coughs> now, and um, one of the, the the great ways of that we work together is in the presentation mm. and in the actual display. And what you're seeing here, a, a few of them are um, some of our dis our, our displays. Yeah. And so I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about the plasticine and how you. Um, came to, to some of the, the kind of tricks of showing your jewelry and rings. Yeah, um, it's um, things that also come kind of naturally close. Sometimes, you know, I use plasticines. I used the first time, use plasticine was just for, when you do casting, you make your little vase out of plasticine, stick your wax in. And you stick your, your wax ring in it, and it's just like, oh, it's mounted there. And that's, that's how it then, at one stage, it, it's ended up, oh, I could use that for presentation. And it's so practical, because you can just stand up your rings. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's so modelable. Mod 
more geo one. Anyway, so it, it's, it has been growing, and I, I don't lose interest in it. It just keeps. I, I can I can just always take it further and re yeah. invent it in every space. You know, uh, adapt it uh, like we did with yeah. you or with. The, I mean, with the paper, it's just uh, it's nice to find yeah. simple solutions to because you have. To, I mean, the jewelry is usually very small, it's rings, so, you know, in an art, I had experience in art galleries where I showed work, then people start standing three meters away with a glass of wine looking at a wall where there's like <laughs> objects like this. So that's a great thing with Jeannie because you, you're close, you have this, and you know, this uh, intimate relationship that you, you, you are close to the jewelry and, and it, it's, I like to transport it that you can come close to it and, you know, Get near it, and that's a yeah. that's an important no, thing. I, that intimacy of yeah. jewelry, well, you you've got to touch it. You have yeah. to touch it. I remember actually the first time I visited a jeweler, and um, they poured into my hand from a little envelope of um, you know they, they took out their envelope and they poured in my hand the diamonds, and they said you have to pick them up and feel them, and and you know it was it, it was so. Um, it was so physical, and and your work is so physical. When you pick them up, your your fingerprints are in them, and uh, and that's something that when people do work with me, I kind of insist upon. And so when I see a visitor kind of looking far away, I say, "Pick it up," you know. <laughs> I pick one up, put it in, into their hands. It's really important, mm. and it's a it's an important interaction, and we don't get that. Uh, so much in art, uh, we we do though in sculpture and in bronzes, and um, that's you know my practice comes out of mm. of showing art, and one of the things that that I've always done in my practice is I've always taken pedestals off. I've you know I hate things in vitrines. I um, I try and bring bring works as close as possible mm. to the viewer. And um, and kind of this sense of preciousness or this distance, we really do try and, and mm -hmm. break that. Right. And do you notice a different audience for Carl's work in comparison to um, when you have an art exhibition? Well, now um, over you know we've we've been showing together mm -hmm. for over the years, so uh, Carl has all kinds of. Followers, um, you know, certainly this this room is amazing. Yeah. Um, many of whom I probably don't know, and they you come out of the jewelry world. Um, mostly, my the you know people who I work with come out of the art world, mm -hmm. and so they come to me for art, and then they discover um, something else. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of my practice is to to show other other disciplines that I believe or, or, and practices that are also um, in the category of art for right. myself. Right. And NYC Jewelry Week it was designed with the intention of trying to broaden the audience um, for jewelry and also to create connections in between um, different areas of jewelry. And, uh, you know, Carl, you're showing your work all over the world and traveling. I mean, do you notice that there is a shifting in understanding or appreciation for the type of work you're making? I think I'm lucky with having these opportunities mm -hmm. to come meet Jeannie and, you know, there is definitely a different audience from the jewelry gallery audience, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know. And these are great moments, and great moments to see that people can engage, and how they and how they surprise, their amazing surprise when they, because they haven't known this existed, and right. and how they just can oh, actually yeah. adapt it. And these are these are great moments, and yeah. I don't too often mm -hmm. witness them because I'm not usually. Most of them not there when the rings are hand, yeah, uh, handed over, but it's it's <laughs> this is great too. You know, yeah. this is wonderful to see and mm -hmm. to see when they when I meet <laughs> them yeah. again. Basically, <laughs> you're killing all <coughs> conventional jewelry when somebody <laughs> starts putting on your rings. It's it's really true. I think we've we've yeah. had a lot of people who who came in wearing one kind of um, jewelry and go out 
uh, wearing yours, and they never stop. And that's why you have uh, women sending you pictures, and, me and men <laughs> too, with you know th their hands completely covered in your rings over the years. But we do. We have people who come um, and kind of take a pilgrimage to to pick out their new Carl Fisch ring. It's beautiful. Well, uh, we have an audience here, maybe of some people who are discovering Carl's work for the first time, um, and definitely some old friends. But we would love to open up to questions if anyone has something to ask Carl. Uh, Kara is going to pass around a mic. Please raise your hand. Yes. Hi. You said that you usually work with just like the material in front of you and go from there, but yeah. how do you work when you collaborate? Like, how does that process go? Um, when I, there's different ways. Sometimes with Francis Ubrichin and Martino Gampa, we just bring our, we just all bring our stuff and then, you know, we'll, uh, when we make an exhibition, we put things in a room. <laughs> And uh, and the very nice thing is, you know, Martino coming from the design world, uh, Francis coming from the art world, and I'm, you can say, craft world. But for it's it's totally even value for us. There's no, you know, it, it's a, such a fun play. It's it's just fantastic. But also sometimes we we work together. We had uh, residences, all three of us together, and we all because we all like making and we all pretty much start the same thing we start find material and then make stuff together and it happened you know we materials mixed in in each other's work and uh, these are really m wonderful collaborations as one example of them yeah, yeah. Uh, the scenographies that you create for your work are so particularly special and evocative, and I think are one of the ways that people feel as though they can approach your work. Have you ever thought about scaling up and playing around with design, furniture, lighting, architecture? Uh, oh yeah, I totally. Um, well, I, I, you know, that DIY, my auntie's DIY mentality. <laughs> 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 you know, when I need a chair for the barbecue, tonight in, at home in yeah. New Zealand, I'll just, I make it up. <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, it's, not it's not meant to be. I make it for myself and yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do things be because, you know, yeah. I like making yeah. anything. I, I would love to build a house. Uh, yeah. um, just so far, it's just been renovating, but, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to see those upscale, barbecue chairs. But I, I, it's, what's that? <laughs> I'd love to see those barbecue chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so cheeky. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, so, so in your work, you work with both um, like precious stones such as rubies and sapphires, but also synthetic stones such as cubic zirconia. Um, yeah. Which ones are your favorite, the synthetic or the uh, precious stones? I, there's there's no favorite. I mean, I I think that's um, that's important for me that they the there's like no favorites. You know, I can I pick up pebbles from the beach. I I I, I buy diamonds. I uh, they come from all different ranges from all different places. But there's no hierarchy in it. I mean, the stones right. It's my favorite when it fits the thing when when. When the ring's good, then that's the one. But it, it's not. It, it's very democratic. Um, those materials, and I, I just favor them by intuitive approach. How frequently do you destroy an in-process ring and start from scratch? Oh, I, I once did that, and I hated that I did that. <laughs> so there's boxes with lots of, things, there's lots of uh, things sitting there, and now I I, I, I think I really only once uh, did it, and now oh. I'm 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 a very annoyed at myself <laughs> <You regret laughs> that I did it <laughs> because 
Yeah, it, it's nice if you can. It's ju the great thing. It's small. You don't have so much storage problems. And um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Even when you travel a show, oh it's very gosh, convenient. They come in little boxes <laughs> in the mail sometimes. <laughs> But you know, often, I, as I say with the waxes, you know, some things I make quick, I know they're good, but sometimes I'm, I don't know right away, and I can't read them yet. And right. they, sometimes they take time for me to understand what I actually did at that moment, and this can take a long time. Because yeah. so there's something, something I, you know, I did it. Right. <laughs> right. Oh. So sometimes you'll put a work away and oh, wait and then bring it out again. They can be yeah. away for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah. There's some haven't made uh, haven't made it out <laughs> of the drawer <laughs> for uh, many years. I when I saw the the piece that you showed with the pla with the uh, plate, metal plate and all these like uh, little stones, right? When you were Oh. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the with the with the young child, I realized how much your work is similar to Lisa Walker's work and her way of, like, it was just really touching to me, like the uh -huh. way she responds yeah. in her art, and I was, in, it was like, oh my God, they're exactly the same, but in <laughs> different. <laughs> um, could you tell a little bit about the like artistic relationship and influences between the two of you as as artists as partners and maybe some. I don't know how th how does it work? Is it dialogue? Uh, very well, it works well. <laughs> it works really good. <laughs> no, uh, it's. Uh, I think that's pretty amazing. We're very lucky that we actually so in a way close, but in a way also so far apart in how our work looks. <laughs> you know, it's uh, very different forms it finds, and it sometimes we laugh uh, at um, when things <coughs> things cross over. You know, there might appear some praying hands, or at some stage uh, here. And oh, but but did you do that? No, I did. It's <laughs> it, these things um, happen quite naturally. Or be, you know, with if you have the same children, <laughs> you're exposed to them. Uh, so no, it's it's a very good. But we keep it very separate. Uh, we, have, we don't work in one room together. The biggest insulation actually is between our two studios. Um, just to uh, uh, not to disturb each other. We, we go to work separately. And uh, um, we don't often, sometimes only, uh, the other, just last month we were, Lisa had a show in London and then I had a show in, in Munich and we sometimes uh, haven't seen each other's works until we go to each other's shows. <laughs> 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 so it's like, oh, I didn't see it. Oh, when did you make that? <laughs> What does your packaging look like? <laughs> packaging for jewelry? Yeah. Oh, you go at the salon. <laughs> there's some. I got We We, 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 we now made have some up. We <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> but I'm promise. sure everyone wants to wear the rings out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, people never take the boxes. In fact, I noticed um, we, we still have a big stack of boxes, and, and we made beautiful boxes. Yeah, and packaging not needed. <laughs> Yeah. No, Straight usually I'm not. I'm uh, usually it's not shipped. my. Uh, I mean, packaging when I ship rings. Yes, I try right. put lots of uh, tissue paper uh, <laughs> <laughs> and big <pick> boxes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, yeah. I'm so curious to know how many people here have a piece of Carl Fritsch jewelry and are wearing it tonight. Okay, so everyone look at each other's fingers as you mingle <laughs> after the talk. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Carl. Thank you thank very much. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you. <laughs>